So uh, <clears throat> we've come to the last lecture and we've all been uh, socially distancing, separating from each other in so many ways, yet also together as one sharing a common stressful and disorienting experience. This experience, I think, for all of us has been one that is equal parts terrifying as we see the infection rates and death rates and threatening economic and even social collapse, not to mention the vacuum of leadership on so many fronts, but also it's been strangely peaceful. As for many of us who are non-essential uh, in our roles, the hustle and the bustle of our everyday lives has temporarily abated. Some have taken up drawing, we binge watched television series we've seen before and even find time for a little introspection. So I want to share my own experiences in quarantine. As a systems thinker and systems scientist and faculty at Cornell, I teach the next generation of graduate students systems thinking, systems mapping and systems leadership. And this course specifically is on the latter. And I'm always looking for new examples that will help students to apply these ideas. As I watch the news, and experience this terrifying peacefulness that is our current norm. I have to say that there couldn't be a more in your face and real world wicked problem that screams for all the things that we have been learning together in this course. What possible alternative scenario other than COVID-19 could make a better case for the immense importance of the best basic systems thinking loop? The idea that we have to conform our mental models to reality rather than conform reality to our mental models. We see the errors of confirmation bias, conforming reality to our mental models, every day playing out in our leadership and the results are deadly real. And what possible alternative scenario other than COVID-19 could we make a better case for the immense importance of complex adaptive systems or CAS? The idea that a system's behavior, say the number of infections and deaths, is an emergent property of the simple rules, social distancing, testing, contact tracing, hand washing, et cetera, followed by locally, by autonomous agents. And boy, can they be autonomous. These agents, we're seeing them on the news every night. So I ask you also, what possible alternative scenario other than COVID-19 could make a better case for the immense importance of understanding human organization and human organizations as a flock rather than a clock? Organizations are not clinical mechanical clockworks that full of hierarchically controlled people uh, do everything that they're told to do. They're self-organizing, organic, unruly beasts with a mind of their own that grow and evolve. Organizations behave more like living things than machines. And they're, they are everywhere, these organizations, not just the formal corporations and bureaucracies, but the informal organization that is often even more important than the formal ones. The spontaneous self-organization that sends tens of thousands of masks, one at a time, to New York in a time of crisis. That is organization too. And finally, I ask you that. What possible alternative scenario, other than COVID-19, could make a better case for the immense importance of systems leadership? Leadership that takes these important ideas into account. Leadership that sees the big picture and the tiniest details. Leadership that works with the four most basic of all functions of organizations, vision, mission, capacity, and learning. So it's that, it, it's that in this period of, terrifying peacefulness. When we have time to question what really matters, what I've found is a renewed love and respect for the work of systems thinking and systems leadership. It turns out, and I admit somewhat surprisingly so, that it is even more important than I thought. And I thought it was pretty important to begin with. Crisis has a clarifying effect and I've gained new clarity in this crisis. Now, I call this the last lecture, not because I think it will be my last, hopefully not, but today may be, for some of you, the last time I get the privilege of influencing your mind. So I wanna share a few last thoughts before you go on your way. 
Some of these thoughts may be new to you, and some you may have heard before, if, if probably many times before, um, and even from me, and some from other places. But I assure you that all of them, all of these ideas, will need to be heard many, many times before you understand their significance. And trust me, because I've ignored them the first dozen or so times that I heard them. I'd like to end our semester together the same way we started it, with the why. Why? Because nature seems to come full circle, and so will I. So in this course, we spent most of our semester learning about the how, how to do things systematically in organizations. We learned that all organizations from cells to corporations have four universal functions. We learned that thinking drives learning, which drives capacity, which drives mission, which drives vision. We learned that leadership is the art and the science of changing things, and that management is the art and science of maintaining things. So we focused a lot on how in this course, but I wanna focus on the why. We started with the why, so I wanna revisit it. Why must we approach problems differently? Why must we make decisions differently? And especially why must we organize differently? And why must we think differently? The reason is things are really bad. And by the way, I gave this lecture before COVID-19. So when I, when I say things are bad, I re mean they're even worse than bad. And that's not just my opinion. It's a fact born of numbers. Uh, there are 27,000 trees per day that are cut down just for toilet paper alone. And that's just for, for, you know, that doesn't include other paper products and wood products. There, the number of species on average that go extinct every day is 137, every day. Uh, the rainforests are being cut down at a rate of 100 acres per minute. One in six children in the United States of America live in poverty. That's 11.9 million children or 16%. All presidents lie in order to pander to a diverse political base, but our current president has taken lying to unprecedented levels. Arguably the most powerful person in the human race had lied 18,000 times in just 1170 days. That's an average of almost uh, 15 and a half lies per day. And what's worse, it appears that he's using these lies not to better our national interests, but to serve his own. In the process, he's discredited and threatened the foundations of the world's greatest democracy. There are uh, 19.7 million Americans with a substance abuse disorder. That's roughly 16% of the country. That means one in six people. And each year, 1.4 million people worldwide die to violence. As of today, the United States has had 1.2 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 and nearly 75,000 deaths. And that, for the United States, is 33% and 28% of the 3.7 million cases and 264 thousand deaths worldwide. That is an astronomical number for the United States to be uh, at 33 percent. In fact, quantitatively, things are actually pretty good. Yeah? The rate of violent crime has been cut in half in the last decade, and it turns out we actually think violent crime is, is worse than it is. We think it's worse than it actually is. The rate of death by war fell 100 times in the last 25 years. There's been a 50-fold drop in the murder rate in Europe between the Middle Ages and the 20th century. This is the very first time in human history for the 70 years since World War II in which the warring superpowers, the warring between superpowers has, has stopped. And globally, 200,000 people a day are lifted above the $2 a day poverty line. That's every day, 200,000 people move above that poverty line. And every day, 300,000 people get access to electricity and clean water. 300,000 new people every day. 
And there are many, many trends in the data that show that things are actually looking up or, or down as it were the case. GDP per capita is trending upward. Life expectancy is trending upward. The number of citizens living under democratic political regimes is increasing. Child mortality is trending steadily downward. So are things good or are things bad? There's a story of a farmer whose wild stallion ran off one day and all the neighbors gathered around saying, oh, what bad luck you've had. The farmer said, bad, good, who knows? A few days later, the stallion returned with a herd of wild horses. The neighbors gathered around saying, what good luck you've had. Bad, good, who knows, the farmer said. A week later, the farmer's son, while trying to break one of the horses, instead was thrown off the horse and broke his leg. The neighbors gathered around and said, what bad luck you've had. And the farmer said, bad, good, who knows. And several weeks later, the army came to the town looking for able-bodied youth to join the army and fight in a land far off. When the soldiers saw the boy's broken leg, they left him alone and moved on. The neighbors all gathered around and said, what good luck you've had. And the farmer said, bad, good, who knows. <clears throat> Cliches can be useful, so remember some of these. Being an optimist and being a pessimist are both biases. While it's sometimes helpful or even necessary to label something as good or, or bad, labeling everything with good and bad labeling guns don't change the facts. Good, bad, who knows? Could be's and should be's are also a form of bias. Again, not that we shouldn't, no pun intended, ever use them, but use them sparingly and be aware when you're using them. My mother used to say, be, not, be sure not to should all over everything. That's a joke. And looking to the future or the past may also be useful, but we have to be and stay in the present. The present really is a present, a gift. Not in a corny but way, but in the way that it just is. The present just is, it's real. We can act in the present. And remember that if you have one foot in yesterday and one foot in tomorrow, you're gonna piss all over today. But what is, what is is at the base of all of it. What is is where the root problem lies and understanding what is, what in this class we've called reality, is also where the solution will be, find, will be found. Sorry, Facts matter, datas matter, the truth matters. But remember what is so often the case, that the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. So don't shoot the messenger. My advice to you in this regard is threefold. First, fall in love. Fall in love with reality. Learn to love hearing it. Learn to love seeing it. Learn to love it. Reality is like a diamond in the rough, like a prickly old timer who's yelling at you to get off their lawn, but who has a deep and interesting story and a heart of pure gold. Reality is lovable. Learn to be curious about why it is the way it is. Don't judge it, just see it the way it is. And see your love of reality for what it really is, a love of survival itself, a love of thriving, because reality is your best friend, your most honest friend, the friend that always tells you you have a booger hanging out of your nose, not to embarrass you, but to save you from future embarrassment. Reality wants you to learn, that is why it is always teaching. And second, fight bullshit. Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Princeton University, Harry Frankfurt, literally wrote the book on bullshit. In his final farewell, late night comic and satirist John Stewart classified bullshit into two types, general day-to-day -day organic free range bullshit and premeditated institutional bullshit. He said, bullshit's everywhere. 
there's very little that you'll encounter in life that has not been in some way infused with bullshit. Not all of it bad. The general day-to-day -day organic free range bullshit is often necessary or at the very least innocuous. Oh, what a beautiful baby you have. I'm sure it'll grow into that head. That kind of bullshit in many ways provides important social contract fertilizer, which keeps people from making each other cry all day. But then there's the more pernicious kind of bullshit, the premeditated institutional bullshit designed to obscure and distract. So take John Stewart's words and don't merely avoid bullshit, but eschew it. Deliberately avoid using it. But in this day and age, even that's not enough. You must repel bullshit. You must fight bullshit like we fight terrorism. And as Stewart advises, if you smell something, say something. But in order to fight bullshit, you have to detect it. And for that, there's no detector that's better for the job than metacognition. And so now I want to talk to you about dinosaurs. Because dinosaurs are bullshit. First of all, we think of a velociraptor as a lizard, but a forelimb fossil discovered in Mongolia, in Mongolia, showed quill knobs like those found in many modern birds, and that discovery transformed our mental model of Velociraptor mongoliensis into being bird-like with feathers. Dinosaurs are amazing because they were huge and fought and they all got wiped out by an even huger meteor that exploded with the force of 10 times the world's entire nuclear arsenal. And that, right there, is how fast bullshit can happen. Did you see how I did it? I just spewed a bunch of well-worn facts as if they were true. I'm an expert here standing on stage and telling you it's all true. But first, Stegosaurus lived 150 million years ago, while T-Rex lived only 65 million years ago. T-Rex and you are closer together in time than T-Rex and Stegosaurus. So this little picture that I showed you that you imagined in your mind, it never happened. Second, we're not even sure that it was a meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs. Today, there are two main camps in paleontology, intrinsic gradualists and extrinsic catastrophists. They have different hypotheses about what happened, so stay tuned. It's okay to say, we don't know. It's okay for you to say, I don't know. We don't know what the truth is. Now, you likely all took a biological course in high school and your teacher likely told you that all life on the planet could be organized into a schema called the biological species concept. Your teacher may have also given you a nifty mnemonic device like Kings play chess on Fridays, generally speaking, to commit this uh, structure to memory. But what they didn't tell you is that this is some bullshit. One, species aren't organized this way. We organize them this way. And two, scientists use up to 26 different organizing models of species, depending on what they're trying to figure out. And this is just one of those 26. Third, there's reason to believe that the whole kingdom metaphor and the king of the jungle stuff is a holdover from when we lived under a monarch. So what is the moral of the story of bullshit? It is to stay frosty because bullshit is all around us all the time. Now you're going to think that I mean pay attention to me, but I don't. I don't mean pay any attention to me or anyone else. Don't listen to your professors or your president. Don't merely absorb what they say. Pay attention for bullshit. It is literally all around you. Assume there's some around and actually look for it. That's my advice about bullshit. Be on the lookout for it. Some purveyors of bullshit take it to a whole new level, what I call an Olympic level of bullshit. Be wary of their tactics. A lot of people are saying, believe me, 
the use of non sequiturs and red herrings, gaslighting, the complexification of things, vague implications with a raised eyebrow and a shrug, ad hominem and straw man attacks, and just run of the mill outright lies. Those are all Olympic level bullshit tactics. But you need to go to the far end of bullshit on the meter of bullshit to find bullshit. You can find it right in front of you in your textbooks and in your politicians and literally in you. Remember that you too are a purveyor of bullshit. And so are all of your friends. In fact, if I were to summarize the findings of the last 60 years of cognitive and neuroscience, I'd summarize it like this. We thought that humans were biased and it turns out that they're even more biased than we thought. So stay frosty is a term that's used in the military and it means keep your emotions in check, which is often a source of a lot of bullshit. It means keep your head on a swivel. It means pay fucking attention. It means stay alert and on one's toes. It means in a word, it means metacognition. Folks in the military often use the phrase stay frosty followed by check your six. This means keep looking behind you, right? For a counterattack. Your six o'clock is your own bias. The bias that is the most difficult to see, your bias. Remember to stay frosty and check your six. I hope that what you've learned in this class is to stay frosty. You count yourself among those that are globally and locally intrapersonally and interpersonally aware. Not to frame things in terms of good and bad, but in terms of their all important context. And then to peer into that context and see the distinctions, the systems, the relationships, and the perspectives that matter and transform. The other thing that you should take in mind is to take that middle way. F. Scott Fitzgerald said, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. Systems thinking is about seeing the middle way, not reductionist or holist, but both, not forest instead of trees, but both, not Apollonian or Dionysian thinking, but both. And remember, you learned all this in Ithaca, the home of Odysseus, the original middle way thinker, and not Republican or Democrat or both. It's about reconciling paradoxes and opposites, goods and bads, yins and yangs. Robert Frost said, three roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the middle way and that has made all the difference. I lied, he didn't say that. <laughs> Uh, there was only two roads in the woods. And that's the point. People always give you two options. Even the woods only give you two options. But there is the middle option. Go that way. Go the middle way. I also want to share with you this idea that you are insignificant. It's true. You and your life are totally insignificant. I want to make sure you know this empirically. Let's take a look at just how insignificant you are. The cosmic calendar compresses the Earth 13.8 billion year history into a single calendar year. And here's what happened in the first four months after the Big Bang on January 1st. The next four months saw the forming of the Milky Way galaxy. And the final four months saw our solar system form and life within it take shape. But let's break down this final month, December, because it's an important month for us. In the first 14 days, multicellular life began. Between December 15th and 29th, we saw a number of other species originate and flourish. And on December 30th, the KT explosion, the one that we think killed the dinosaurs, came and made the dinosaurs extinct, so we think, or something else happened. On December 31st, the last day of the year, that was a particularly important day for us. 
as that was the dawn of the apes and the hominids. In particular, at around 8 p.m. on the 31st of December, just hours before midnight, humans and chimpanzees split in the evolutionary tree. And at 9.25 p.m., the first walking humans arrived. 9.25, we're just a few hours from the end of the year. All of human modern and pre-modern history occurs in the last 60 seconds of the year. China begins with 10 seconds left in the year. Christ and Muhammad were born between six and three seconds before the end of the year. Columbus arrives in America one second before midnight. Now let's zoom in on this little factoid. It says, a human life only lasts the blink of an eye in the cosmic calendar. And it gives you the formula over the 13.8 billion years that leads to 0.23 cosmic seconds is a human lifespan. And they're being generous by giving the human lifespan 100 years. The average human lifespan today is actually 71. In human time scale, the human life is on average 71 years. And that 71 years is 25,915 sunrises. I try to be awake for all of them. That means that if, I, if things work out as an average, I have, a, I have about 7,665 sunrises left in my life. Now, if you're around 30, then you have almost twice as many, 14,965 sunrises that you have left in your life. And that means that you're over halfway done if you're 30-ish. So I have a question for you. If you knew you only had $15,000 to last you the entire rest of your life, how would you spend $1? How will you spend your 15,000 sunrises? Have fun, wake up early, be present for every one of those sunrises. Make the most of it. You are insignificant. Your problems are insignificant. Now here's another number. That's how many people there are in the world as of this morning at sunrise. 7.7 billion. But I wanna share with you a few more numbers that are based on if, if, the were, if we took that population and reduced it down to just 100 people, what would that population look like? If the world were just 100 people, 60 would be Asian, 16 would be African, 10 Europeans, nine Latin Americans, and five North Americans. If the world were just 100 people, 84 would be religious, and 16 would be not religious. If it were just 100 people, 78 would have houses, shelter. 22 don't have any shelter at all. If it were just 100, 54, would be in urban and 46 would be rural. If it were just 191 would have safe and drinking water, nine unimproved water, 11 would be undernourished, one would have HIV AIDS and one would have tuberculosis. If it were just 182 would have electricity, 18 wouldn't. 65 people would have cell phones and 47 would be active internet users, 95 on the mobile cellular network. If the world were just 100 people, 68 would have improved sanitation, 14 would have no toilets, and 18 would have unimproved toilets. And if the world were 100 people, 77 would have a primary education, 64 secondary, and seven people would have an undergraduate college degree. In 2006, only one person out of 100 would have had a college education. Today, that number has jumped to seven. So what do all these numbers mean? What do they mean? What they mean is you are the chosen one. You are the chosen one. I mentioned earlier that you and your life are insignificant, and yet you are the chosen one. The language of nature isn't math, remember, although math is uh, uniquely remarkable language. 
The language of nature is paradox. Nature has had a long time to reconcile paradoxes. So yes, your life is insignificant and you are the chosen one. I wanna make sure you know this also, that you're the chosen one. Because if not you, who? You're part of the 0.001%, the 0.0001% that has an advanced degree from an Ivy League university, or almost. In fact, even without an Ivy League degree, if you have shelter, enough food to eat, potable water, electricity, a computer, a degree, or a graduate degree, you are part of the 1%. You're not in the 1% because of your smarts and your good nature and your good looks. I hate to break it to you. Do you know why you're in the 1%? You're in the 1% because you got lucky and because the world is unfair. You got good parents or a good break or whatever it is that brought you into the 1%. You might think that it was your hard work and determination that got you there, but where did you get those qualities from? No matter how far back you draw the chain of causality, the truth will be evident. The world is unfair and you just got lucky. You are the chosen ones. And because much has been given to you, much is expected. Etched on my immigrant father's gravestone is a quote from the American president, John F. Kennedy. A quote my father said to us kids all too often. For of those to whom much is given, much is required. You might say to yourself, how could I, little old insignificant me, change the world? For that, I have a story for you, or a few, about idolizing authority figures and playing small. In Hans Christian Andersen's children's story, The Emperor Has New Clothes, a vain emperor is conned by two weavers he hires to make him new clothes so that they don't actually have to make the clothes. The weavers convince the emperor that the fabric they use is so fine that it is invisible to those who are unfit for their positions. Although no one can see the clothes because they don't actually exist, the emperor's ministers all pretend to see them lest they be deemed unworthy for their own positions. The weavers bring the emperor's cl finished clothes, the finished garments to him and they mime putting them on him. And the emperor then marches in a parade to show off his new clothes, his new robes, and everyone plays along with the pretense. And a single child blurts out from the crowd, hey, the emperor has no clothes. The crowd takes up the cry, but the emperor continues on with the pretense, even though he recognizes, recognizes that what the child said is true. That's the story of the emperor's new clothes. And I wanna tell you four more little vignette stories about a medic, a senator, a Nobel laureate, and a multimillionaire. They walk into a bar, let's say. This might be an intro to a joke, but it, it is actually four vignettes from my life, the shortened versions of which I'll share with you now. As a high school flunk out, I started adulthood with not too much confidence in my smarts or academic prowess. I certainly never dreamed I'd end up at Cornell or be a scientist or a systems theorist. But along the way, I had four prominent emperor has no clothes moments that gave me the confidence that I wasn't an imposter and that I had something to say and contribute. The first was when I trained to be a medic on an ambulance. I thought medics were pretty legendary. And so as a young man, I dreamed of becoming one. I wasn't sure at the time if I could even pass the test or become certified, but I did. I eventually passed it. My first shift on the ambulance, my first shift on the ambulance, my lead medic was a seasoned veteran who had been doing it for years. And as the night shift wore on, I came to realize that he was a complete boob who didn't know a cannula from a catheter. I was shocked and remembered thinking, how is this possible? How could this person that I thought was gonna be so amazing turn into this? Fast forward many years, and I had the privilege of meeting a world famous phys physicist. 
I wanted to download his entire brain to understand the deep wisdom that he gleaned from such a basal understanding of the universe. What I learned is that he was self-centered, angry, psychosocially inept. He was a man baby who had eschewed his own family and come to the end of his life alone. How could someone I thought to be so wise be so clueless to any learnings outside of his discipline or domain? How is this possible? Some years later still, I was invited to give a big talk. It was the first talk I had ever given where there was a legitimate green room with hors d'oeuvres and swanky seating. I was joined by another speaker who was a US Senator. And I remember thinking, I am so far out of my depth. But then he started talking to me as if I was his fraternity brother. And he quickly revealed that he was a small thinking, chauvinistic, elitist, self-serving douchebag. Again, I was shocked. How could a man make it all the way to the US Senate and be so sophomoric? I remember thinking, how is this possible? In each case, it was possible because it is often the case that the emperor has no clothes. Of course, over the years, I've met hundreds of incredibly ethical, competent, remarkable people too. But just because someone is large and in charge doesn't mean that they are, as my mother would say, all that and a bag of nuts. I don't know why I've had to learn this lesson so many times in life, but reality keeps teaching it to me. Respect authority if their behavior warrants respect. Otherwise, make your own way. Don't look for their approval to make change in the world. If not you, who? <clears throat> there are all kinds of reasons we undermine ourselves while we overestimate others. As inoculation against this subversive practice, I give you two ideas, both of which I'll borrow from others who are wiser than me. Marianne Williamson said it better than I ever could. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And Mother Teresa said it too. She said, people are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you're kind, people will may, may accuse you of being selfish and having ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you're honest and sincere, people may deceive you, but be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight, but create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have and it will never be enough, but give your best anyway. In the final analysis, it was never between you and them anyway. <clears throat> the Constitution of the United States starts with the most popular line, we the people of the United States. We the people. That usually gets the most attention and for good reason, we the people. But my favorite line of, of the Constitution as a systems thinker isn't this one. It's the next bit. In order to form a more perfect union. The point is that things are incremental as the systems thinking loop tells us. Perfection isn't going to happen overnight. 
In fact, things are never going to be perfect, but they can be more perfect. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the great. Our job is not to sit in judgment and then exit, nor to get down on ourselves when we do not live up to our most espoused values. Our job is to form a more perfect union, to always strive to get more feedback, to learn more, to adapt more, to make things more better. Not perfect, more perfect. So my final parting advice to you is this. Go forth and multiply. <clears throat> what I'm asking you all to do is go forth and multiply. Of course, I don't mean have lots of children. Although you should definitely have children. They're the best thing you'll ever do. What I mean is go forth and multiply your good effect on the world. Pervasively, gritfully, purposefully, formally, impatiently, addictively, go forth and multiply your good effect on the world. To impact this world positively, to multiply yourself, you'll need to find your special purpose. Find a purpose that hits on your sweet spot between four things. What you're passionate about, what you're good at, what you can get paid for. That one's really for your parents. And most of all, what the world needs. Don't try to find and execute your purpose. Yoda said, there is no try. Find it and execute it. If you don't know what your purpose is yet, make it your purpose to find your purpose. And when you meet with obstacles, do it anyway. When you meet with obstacles, remember Randy Pausch's advice that the obstacles are there to show you how bad you really want it. When these obstacles lay your sundry weaknesses bare for the world to see, answer them by transforming your weaknesses into strengths. But go forth with two dispositions that I hope were reinforced in this course. Go forth with science and go forth with humanism. Go forth with science, observe the world, and test against reality with reason and facts and evidence over superstition, religiosity, authority, myth, innuendo, charisma, and gut feelings. And go forth with humanism, an ethic that we can form a more perfect union, a more perfect world. And God damn it, go make the world a better place than you found it. I've had a great semester with you guys, and Laura has too. And uh, it's been a crazy one, especially the way it's ended. Yeah. But here we are. We love reality. We really appreciated all of you all year, all semester. And you have big things to do in your lives. So go forth. We're here, always, always.